In our everyday conception of the physical world, the world out there, we think of the world as containing objects, as consisting of objects which have their own existence independent of our observation. And we regard those objects as persisting over time, which allows us to, to think of our sensations, for example, our visual sensations as the appearances of physical objects at some moment during their life history. And it is what fundamentally underwrites the ability to say, well, this object I'm seeing now is the same as an object I saw earlier. And these objects possess properties like shape and color and position, at which we assign on the basis of their appearances. And these objects are also re-identifiable. And so here I'm making a distinction between persistence and re-identifiability. Persistence is the underlying assumption about how the world works, even when we're not looking. Re-identifiability is more a statement about the capability of agents and the way objects behave. So the idea is that certain properties of objects are relatively stable over time, for example, shape and color. And these are the perceptual handles which agents can actually use to actually re-identify objects and say, yes, this is actually something that I saw earlier. And these ideas are largely carry forward with some modifications, of course, into the fundamental framework of classical physics. And for definiteness, let me just talk about classical particle point mechanics. So here we would say, well, the physical world consists of point particles and they persist, in fact, persist indefinitely over time. So theoretically, that's what underpins the possibility of labeling. And then they possess properties, which there's a strict demarcation to static and dynamic properties. And finally, they can be re-identified. Now, this framework brings about the, the following possibility, which doesn't exist in everyday life, namely that two objects, say two point particles, could have exactly the same intrinsic properties. So we would say they're identical. And so we have the following conundrum that arises as a result, which cannot arise in everyday life, which is that we could have a snapshot. We could say we have two particles initially that we observe. And then a little time later, we observe two particles. Let's say we, we're, we're, we know we've been told that they are the same two particles, but we don't have enough information to say which is which, although we know because of the underlying assumption of persistence that one is A and one is B. But here the classical framework comes in and says, well, the particles do traverse continuous trajectories and an ideal observer is able to actually trace and track them over time and thereby able to re-identify them. So the bottom line is that in classical physics, even though the possibility of identicality arises as a new possibility because of the theoretical abstraction from everyday experience, nonetheless, it's possible for agents to re-identify them. So we can treat them just in the same way as, uh, as, as non-identical particles. And this situation fundamentally and decisively changed uh, as a result of the development in quantum theory of, in particular, Bose's counting procedure, which he used to derive Planck's black body radiation curve. So here we have a phase space broken into cells. And what Bose does is to consider photons, particles, in these cells in the standard way, but with the crucial difference that now all that matters is how many of these are in each cell, not which of them are in each cell. And this was almost immediately identified as something very significant in need of interpretation and understanding. And Langevin said this, he said, formally one decomposed the phase space into cells attributing an individuality to each constituent of the system. It seems today that one must modify this method by suppressing the individuality of the constituents of the system. And considerably later in the last 
decade of his life, Schrodinger said this, which is even more striking. If I observe a particle here and now and observe a similar one a moment later at a place very near the former place, not only cannot I be sure whether it is the same, but this statement has no absolute meaning. So that's a very, very striking statement. But there's a complication, which is that um, almost immediately after Bose and Fermi posited their counting procedures, Dirac and Heisenberg were interested in finding a way to incorporate those counting procedures into the nascent formalism of quantum theory that they were developing. Um, and so Dirac and Heisenberg posited what we know as the symmetrization postulate. And for example, Dirac argued in his 1926 paper roughly as follows. He said that, well, imagine I write down a state of say two electrons, so two identical particles. Um, then I could also write down this state, right, where x1 and x2 have been swapped. Theoretically, they're different, but observationally, and this was the posit of Dirac, um, that identical particles, he said, were indistinguishable from one another. Um, and if we accept this idea, or if we accept this posit, then we have a kind of theoretical redundancy. So we have two mathematical objects which, which basically refer to the same state of affairs, at least as far as any observer is concerned. And so to remove this theoretical redundancy, he said, well, okay, let's disallow each of these states separately and just allow symmetric or anti-symmetric combinations of them. And this gave rise to, this reproduced the Bose and Fermi counting procedures. So it's a very elegant argument and a very elegant formalization. And Dirac himself, on the basis of this, interpreted his procedure as follows. He said, if a system in atomic physics contains a number of particles of the same kind, identical particles, the particles are absolutely indistinguishable from one another. So what I want to impress upon you is that we have here at the very early stages, two very different interpretations coming out. And we can put them alongside each other in the following way. The, the first is that identical particles are not persistent individuals. So then they lack persistence, the quality of persistence that we attribute to ordinary objects. So this is a, a very deep undermining of our everyday intuitions about physical objects. The second option due to Dirac retains persistence. So these objects are still persistent they can be labeled theoretically, but on the other hand, they're not re-identifiable at all by any observer. And today, these are the interpretational options that we still have on the table and, and people in, invo involved in interpretations of uh, the quantum treatment of identical particles still speak in these terms. But there are problems with both of these interpretations, serious problems in my view. The first is that when we actually look at what we do as physicists, when we interpret primary experimental data, we routinely assume persistence and in fact re-identifiability, at least in special cases. So let's say we look at a bubble chamber image like this. And if you actually look at the data, what you see is a sequence of bubbles. But what we do is we interpret these things as tracks of particles. And in that very act of speaking of the data in that way, we are presuming the validity of the idea of persistence and re-identifiability. Otherwise, it would make no sense to talk of a track left by a particle. And so the question is, how do you reconcile this with these two interpretations? It's not easy. The second issue is, is more subtle and it's, it's, it's rarely remarked upon, which is that neither interpretation when you to formalize it in a natural way yields the mathematical form of the symmetrization postulate to raise the bar in a sense for any interpretation of quantum theory or any part thereof. 
which is to say that if you really say that you understand a part of quantum theory or quantum theory as a whole, intuitively, conceptually, then you really ought to be able to formalize it, possibly with the addition of additional assumptions, of course, and derive the, the, the formalism itself. And that gives you real confidence in your interpretation. And if you can't do that, then that really does cast doubt on your interpretation. I'll come back to this in a moment, this idea. Um, so for example, Dirac, um, in 1927, he became aware that his argument of redundancy fails to generalize to more than three particles. This became clear through a paper by Wigner. And in 1930, he, he falls back to essentially a completely different justification for the symmetrization postulate. He says, for some particular kind of particle, it is quite possible for only symmetrical or anti-symmetrical states to occur in nature. Whether this is the case cannot be decided by any general theoretical considerations that can be settled only by reference to special experimentally determined facts. Okay, so he's now saying this is essentially empirical in nature. So the question then is how do we get past this apparent impasse? And so what we face here is a problem, really a special case of our general problem of how do we interpret quantum theory. And I just want to zoom out for a moment, and this connects with discussions that have been happening during the week and particularly in the panel discussion yesterday. So when we talk about classical physics, um, the question is, well, why do we say that we understand it, that we feel that we have a good interpretation of what it's saying about how nature works? I would say, I would put it to you that it's, it's because that classical physics has this threefold structure. At the bottom, we have a classical conception of reality that was articulated vividly by, by Galileo and Descartes and others. Um, so this geometric mechanical conception of reality with a very clear concept of causation, um, a very clear conception of how this relates to human observation. And when that conception of reality is mathematized in quite a natural way, it gives rise to the abstract mathematical framework that lies underneath all of classical physics. And then we build specific classical physical theories within it. And so this gives us a sense of deep understanding of classical physics. And where we would like to be vis-a-vis -vis quantum theory is this, we would like a quantum conception of reality that underpins the quantum mathematical framework and to be clear, I'm referring to the abstract framework, the, the core quantum formalism. But of course, we don't have that quantum conception of reality. That's been the case for around 100 years now. And so again, the question is, how do we break this impasse? And the program that I've been working with uh, for, for a long time now is the following, that if we really want to make decisive progress, in interpretation, what we have to do is find a set of physical principles which we can formalize in a natural way and thereby derive the quantum mathematical framework in its entirety. That's the reconstruction program, which again has been talked about a lot already at the conference. And then the idea is that when we talk about interpreting quantum theory, we need to interpret the physical principles. And that has a lot of advantages, which I won't go into here, but one of the key advantages is that physical principles are conceptually digestible in a way that mathematics isn't. One of the other great advantages is that this largely eliminates the, the problem with, I think, most interpretational work that I'm certainly aware of, which is the danger of taking the mathematical formalism of quantum theory and giving it the interpretation of the part that you can understand and ignoring the mathematics, which is too abstract to conceptually digest. Okay, so you end up, I think, with a huge underdetermination of interpretations as a result of this fundamental weakness to that strategy of trying to read the formalism directly. So the idea is we don't read the mathematics directly, we read the physical principles. And so in previous work, I've uh, reconstructed the Feynman rules of quantum theory and then the quantum formalism from that point of view. And I'm going to now approach identical particles within this framework. Let me very briefly just say what I mean by the framework Feynman 
laid out. So, you know, we have a particle moving in one dimension, classically moves along a trajectory from A to B, let's say it's a free particle. And what we need to do according to Feynman is consider all possible trajectories to go from A to B, assign a quantum amplitude to each of them. And then we say the amplitude to go from A to B is, is given by this. I'm not talking about the, the mathematical difficulties of actually carrying out this summation here. So this is just a quick overview. Uh, and then there's a product rule, which says if you want to work out the amplitude of a particular trajectory, you can break it into sub-trajectories and multiply the amplitudes of those sub-trajectories. And finally, the probability rule connects these amplitudes, which are abstract, to something we can measure. So we can say the conditional probability of detection at B given detection at A earlier is given by mod Z squared. So in a nutshell, these are Feynman's rules of quantum theory. But what about identical particles? So this is what Feynman proposed that, well, imagine we've got a scattering, let's say of two non-identical particles where the interaction Hamiltonian doesn't depend on the, the characteristic in which they differ, which allows us to distinguish them. And so we have a scattering amplitude in this case, but we have another scattering amplitude where they don't scatter quite the same way. And so what happens if we deal with two identical particles? Well, then Feynman proposed the, the following rule, alpha one, two plus or minus alpha two, one. So this is the counterpart of Dirac's symmetrization postulate. And this is the form in which I will reconstruct the symmetrization postulate. So the question is, how do we go about this reconstruction? And I, here I'm just going to focus on the key ideas. Um, so the idea is that we go back to the level of data. This is the operational perspective. We go back to bare data and so what we have to imagine is something like this, that we, we, we have flashes. We don't have objects. We don't say we see electrons. All we say is that we have two flashes. And let's suppose they're identical. And let's suppose we can operationalize this idea of identical flash. Let's take that as a given. So we see these identical flashes, two of them at some initial time. And we then see them at some later time. And now we have to say, well, how do we theoretically model this flash data? And there really, if you think about it, two distinct models that you can create. The first is to say, well, each flash has, as it were, its underpinning as the, as the underpinning of each flash is a persistent individual object. In that case, we can say that it's the case that either this must have happened, right? So the transition that occurred must have been this one, the direct transition, let's say, or this one. These are the two stories that we can tell based on this model. And the crucial assumption is persistence of individuals underlies these flashes. But there is another model that you could create, which is to say that, well, there are no persistent individuals. All there is is an abstract physical system, which on, at each time manifests itself as two flashes. And in that case, in that model, all you can say is there are two flashes and two flashes. There's no more fine grained story that you can tell. So we have these two models. And now the crucial thing is, well, what do we do with these two models? So the two possible theoretical structures. So what we can do now is to synthesize them so we take now the Feynman formalism for single systems as a given, and we describe each of these models within that formalism. So for example, here with a persistence model, we can assign an amplitude to this transition, alpha one, two, and for the indirect transition, likewise, alpha two, one. And then for the non-persistence model, there's an amplitude as well. And there's an asymmetry here I just want to point out because in the non-persistence model, the amplitudes alpha one, two and alpha two, one are things that we already know how to in principle calculate uh, in standard ways. But in the non-persistence model, this amplitude is something that 
we don't know how to calculate using classical quantum correspondence. So we need a new principle here if we're going to make headway. And so this is where I inject, as it were, the new idea, the new mathematical postulate, which is to say that the amplitude in the non-persistence model is some function, h, of the two amplitudes in the persistence model. Okay, so this is the assumption, which allows us to, as it were, glue these two models together, synthesize them, if you like. And I make an analogous assumption if you've got flash, flash, flash. This is just necessary to, to make the derivation possible. And so it's exactly the same idea that we, we've got four stories on the left-hand side that we can, we can tell based on the persistence model. We can assign an amplitude to each of them. And then we can say the amplitude in the non-persistence model is given by some function of those four amplitudes. And so remarkably, very little more needs to be assumed to derive the symmetrization postulate. And the essence of the idea is that sometimes it's possible to find a situation where you can calculate an amplitude for a process in one of two different ways. And of course, for consistency, theoretical consistency, we want those to agree. Each such call for consistency gives rise to a functional equation. And if you have enough of these functional equations, it turns out you can actually determine the unknown function, g and h. Let me just give you a quick taste of how this is done. I won't go into all the details. Suppose you want to work out the, the amplitude in this case. Well, you can do it as follows. What you could say is, I'm going to split this up as it were into two processes and series. And I'm going to use the h function, right, to work out the amplitude of this bottom process. And likewise, use the h function to work out the amplitude in the top process. And then I'm just going to use the Feynman product rule to multiply those together. So that's a perfectly legitimate way of proceeding. But the alternative is to use the, the G function, right? So to consider this as a monolithic process, flash, 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 that's your experimental data. And then we've got the story on the left-hand side. And we can work out the amplitude of each of these processes on the left-hand side using a similar procedure. We can split it up into two, each of these. We can multiply the amplitudes. We can do the same for all of the others. And then we can combine those amplitudes together using the G function. So that's where the G function plays a key role. And so we have here a functional equation. So this is the result of demanding consistency. And finally, um, there's an, an additional condition which I want to mention, which is physically very important. And it connects all the way back to what I was talking about with particle tracks. And that is to say that we have the experience as experimenters which what makes physics possible of being able to isolate experiments from each other. I can do electron diffraction experiment on the earth, you can do it on the moon. And we have the idea that our electrons are fundamentally independent of one another. We can ignore each other's experiments. Um, and so this gives rise to this following idea that if there is this isolation, I ought to be able to assign an amplitude to my transition, you can assign an amplitude to your transition, and we could work out transition probabilities in that way. And so the transition probability for this entire process, the two experiments considered as one, is given by here, this mod uv squared. But of course, we can also use this h function. Um, and when we do that, we get this alternative expression, h mu nu, h of uh, uv comma zero, and, and the requirement now is that these transition amplitudes agree. So this is the isolation condition, which injects this idea that we can actually do these isolated experiments, at least in principle. So on the basis of this, it turns out you can actually solve for H um, and you get the symmetrization postulate in Feynman's form. And the argument does generalize to an arbitrary number of particles. I'm using particles as a generic term. What I really mean is identical subsystems.
So we're much more familiar with the symmetrization postulate in the language of states. So you can transform uh, this idea, this Feynman form of the symmetrization postulate over to the state formulation. And I just want to briefly say that this is rather intriguing. What ends up happening is that you see the symmetrization postulate in a completely new light. But on the right hand side, the two functions are defined over the full configuration space. So x1 and x2 are both, you know, they're over, over r. So x1, x2 is over r squared. But x1, x2 on the left are actually defined over the reduced configuration space. So another way of saying this is that on the right hand side, x1 and x2 refer to the positions of particle one and particle two, just as we ordinarily think of it. But x1 and x2 on the left hand side refer to the location of the leftmost and rightmost detections. So on the left hand side, there are no particles, there are only detections. And this statement is only true over, this only holds over reduced configuration space. And of course, as a mathematical trick, one can extend the function that I previously had over the reduced configuration space, we can extend it to the full configuration space and we get something that looks like Dirac symmetrization postulate, but its meaning is completely different. Um, and so I just want to briefly say this, that from this perspective of the reconstruction, the symmetrization postulate is not a selection rule as it's almost universally thought, but really a bridging rule. It, it bridges between two distinct models of, of the same flash data, if you like. And this gives rise to the possibility of uh, resolving a lot of puzzles that, uh, that people, for example, in philosophy of physics, literature still concern themselves with, which is like, how do I understand the indices? Are they particle labels or something else? And in the physics literature, there's a, a lot of thought about how do you understand entanglement of identical particles? Again, this perspective. This is a new perspective, which can, I think, resolve a lot of those issues. But what I want to do now is really turn to interpretation. Since this is a foundations conference, I'm going to uh, focus more on the, the conceptual side. Um, how do we interpret this? What does this mean? So summarizing the persistence and the non-persistence models are incompatible models of the same flash data. Um, yet they both capture some truth about the underlying reality. How else can we explain that when we synthesize them, we get a formalism that is empirically adequate? So as I say, they can be synthesized. It's an abstract mathematical procedure. And to my mind, it's miraculous that it works. Right, so, but nonetheless, it does work. And on the basis of these observations, I would put it to you that these models are really complementary models in the sense of Bohr, in the sense that Bohr meant it. Now to just disambiguate, Bohr did articulate different conceptions of complementarity during the 30 or so years that he wrote about it, um, but the, conception I'm referring to is his earliest conception, which I really think is the one that hits the nail on the head. So here he is talking about the nature of light. So the two views of the nature of light as particle-like or wave-like are rather to be considered as different attempts of the interpretation of experimental evidence in which the limitation of classical concepts is expressed in complementary ways. So to be, to be very clear here, the idea is that it's the same experiment, one and the same experiment, the same set of experimental data, where on the one hand, we're forced to use a particle model to explain, for example, here, the, the particle-like or the point-like detections on our screen. But on the other hand, we're forced to adopt a, a wave-like way of thinking to explain the distribution of these points. So, uh, later on in his life, uh, Bohr did articulate different conceptions of complementarity. And in fact, we, you know, we use some of those ideas today, for example, in the guise of mutually unbiased bases. That's not what I'm referring to here. So I'm referring to Bohr's original conception 
And one can make this more precise. So in the derivation of Feynman's rules that I mentioned earlier, um, it's possible to, to interpret that very much in the spirit of Bohr's complementarity. So we could say that we've got a double slit experiment here. We want to work out the transition amplitude from A to C. And what you could say is that what we do is we, we can create a model where we think of the electron as particle-like, so which means we oblige it to have traveled through one slit or the other, and we assign amplitudes to each of these stories that, 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 uh, that we have that we can tell. And then the, the, the Feynman sum rule really says, well, this is how you have to combine the amplitudes to figure out the transition amplitude in your experiment. And in the reconstruction of Feynman rules I've done earlier, this is really what's driving the whole derivation. That's the underlying idea, although that's, I didn't appreciate that fully when I wrote that paper. But now returning to the everyday conception of reality that I began with at the beginning, um, we say in everyday experience that objects persist over time. And we also assume that the objects take the same form between their appearances as during their appearances. So if I see an object, I see it now, it appears to me a certain way, then in the everyday way of thinking about the physical world, I, I think it's perfect, I, I allow myself to visualize the object as having that same form, even when I'm not looking at it. And that plays a fundamental role to our, our modeling. Um, and so when it comes to interpretation of quantum theory, I think we will never be satisfied unless we can go back to some everyday conception of reality and say, that's where we went wrong. That's the point where we made an assumption. It may be very deep rooted assumption. It may be deep rooted in our physiology, in our language, our everyday language, everyday experience, but we need to be able to go back and say, that's what needs to change. That's where we, uh, where quantum theory, the possibility of quantum theory enters. And so what I would say is that the two complementarities, the, the Bohr complementarity and the complementarity I'm positing here, really challenge both of these ideas, both of these deeply rooted assumptions, and also allow us to transcend them in a controlled way. So the persistence of individual objects according to, to the view I'm putting forward here is a modeling assumption. It's not a fact of the matter. It's a modeling assumption that we add on top of bare observations. And there's an alternative assumption which is at least theoretically credible, conceptually credible, which is that the only thing that persists is some whole, some abstract system, if you like. And the detections are simply a manifestation of that. And the Bohr complementarity, uh, I believe we can better think of it as really saying that the, an object's properties are not related in a simple way to its appearances. And this needs to obviously be clarified, but I won't go into that because that's a separate talk. And so what I'm proposing here really is that complementarity can be thought of not any longer as merely descriptive in the sense that it was for Bohr. Uh, it was a very powerful idea, but it's really descriptive of some process that de Broglie had already put in motion uh, of synthesizing somehow particle and wave pictures that Schrodinger obviously uh, encompassed in his wave equation. So here what we're seeing is that complementarity can be turned into a systematic procedure within this context of reconstruction for actually seeing how we can synthesize uh, mutually incompatible models of, of quantum data. And this allows us to move in a controlled way beyond a specific conception of reality, particularly the everyday conception of reality. So I'll just leave you with the following Sorry, um, thought. Philip, just a, a quick reminder, you have five minutes and then there will be 10 minutes for questions, okay? All right, wonderful, thank you so much. So I'd like to just leave you with a, a few 
thoughts, things I've been thinking about, particularly over the last several months. Um, what is really real, right? This is, this is the, I guess, the underlying big question. This is the question essentially of, traditionally of metaphysics, what, what really exists in the world? Um, based on what I'm saying, it's neither the case that there exist individual persistent objects, nor that there exists a single monolithic object. Um, and in and metaphysics, this goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks and probably before that, this tension between whole or part or monism and pluralism. In other words, monism would be the view that there's a single entity, single abstract thing which exists and what we perceive as persistent objects are really, as it were, bundles of recurrent sensations. Um, then the pluralist view would be, well, no, that they really exist individual objects. There is some substance, some abstract substance and properties in here in that substance. And, and that those substances that really persist over time. And that's what underpins the idea of persistent individual object. So these, are, these views have been in tension ever since and even now nowadays. So what I'm proposing, I think, uh, is really saying that, well, neither of these is, is strictly true, at least from this perspective, neither of these is strictly true, um, but both capture some truth. And I know that's certainly in Western metaphysics, especially in, in modern analytical metaphysics is, is a very uncomfortable idea and it's not something that people normally entertain. Um, but I think, I think we're pretty much, at least I feel pretty much forced to that position. But then the question is, what, what is real? Um, what can we say is our solid ground? And here I have to say that the only thing that I think we can fall back to is the experimental data. Um, and of course, this is a very fraught problem of, of how do you create an ontology of experimental data. If you want to do that, you have to take the observer's experience seriously, and you have to take the observer as a primary aspect of, physical, of reality and not just something subsidiary and contingent. And so this connects um, to a comment that was made by, for example, Bill Waters in the panel discussion yesterday. So I think that we may need to think of mentality as a counterpart to materiality um, so we have to think about reality as containing, as it were, these two parts. And this idea has been to some degree fleshed out, for example, by Whitehead in his process philosophy, where you have these ideas of actual occasions. So you have this kind of primitive mentality, something much more basic than our understanding of consciousness or mentality, something more primitive than that. But anyway, so these are these are some very much uh, open thoughts, uh, very primitive thoughts uh, at the present time. And one of the open questions I have is, well, why does this complementarity procedure even work? How is it even, why does it even work mathematically to synthesize these incompatible models? Can we generalize in any way this process of synthesis? Can we thereby introduce more degrees of freedom? I, I'm not sure if that will work. Uh, Reinhard Werner yesterday, kind of pointed out that generalizations like that are rarely fruitful, and that's my intuition here as well. One thing I find more intriguing is the possibility that there may be situations where there are more than two complementary models. And um, th I think there are situations in mathematical biology which, which suggest that that might be possible. But again, these are very um, hesitant thoughts I'm putting forward really in the spirit of triggering discussion or triggering uh, creative insights in, in the audience. So I'll leave you with re some references. So the first paper here is the primary paper on which this talk is based. The second paper is the one which contains the mathematics. I should warn you that the second paper, um, when I did the second, when I wrote that, 2015 paper, I didn't have my concepts correct. So I still speak about identical particles as being indistinguishable in that paper, which is obviously, I don't believe that's the case now, but the mathematics is, is fine. And I also, I'd 
like to refer you to my website. It contains all the papers. It also record, contains videos of talks, including talks on reconstruction of Feynman's rules. Thanks very much for your attention. So thank you, Philip, for your talk. We have time for some questions. Okay, Rochelle versus Chazlov. Hi, Philip. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask you about the nature of these flashes that you introduced at the beginning as something which is, um, uh, well, operationally justified. You said, let's us assume that. At the end, even you said that it's an experimental data. Now, when you uh, derive this, uh, the rule, uh, at one moment you have this decomposition, like composite map, uh, when you have three pairs of flashes, one, two, and, and two, three. Now, now, as long as I have just one, uh, like uh, two pairs, like one situation, the original situation, I can understand them as a kind of preparation and measurement at the end. Now, when I try to decompose this, am I still allowed at the position two, so to say, to assume that they are obtained by some measurement and re-preparation? And if not, do I, uh, how should I understand these flashes um, across these decompositions? And I think it's closely related to this and I add this, like, do you understand what physical meaning is of this possibility to decompose this? What, what, what will be the physical postulate that would allow this decomposition? Thank you very much. Okay, Chasna, so let me, that's a great question, but I don't think I fully understand it. I'm not sure I fully understand it. Are you referring to this situation here? We've got flash, 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 and we can do some sort of decomposition. Is yes. that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so basically the idea is that when we want to describe this in the quantum formalism for single systems, we're regarding these two flashes as manifestations of a single system. Right, so we're basically saying there are two identical flashes, um, and then two identical flashes, then two identical flashes, and we're doing the usual thing that we do when we apply Feynman's rules. So we can, as it were, break up a trajectory into pieces. We can piece them together. Um, so that's all I'm doing here. So I'm not seeing that, I suppose I'm not seeing your issue or concern. Sorry, maybe I was not clear, but like, then you want to preserve coherence in this process, like in Feynman rules. And, and the first pair of flashes and the last pair of flashes, there I don't need to have coherence because I, I can identify them with the experimental data that will be related either to preparation at the beginning and maybe measurement at the end. But the flash, two flashes in the middle seems to have a different let's say, ontological status, because I want to preserve coherence. Right, yeah, so I, you know, I didn't talk about the conditions that would make all of this, all of these issues, you know, deal with these issues, you're quite right. So, you know, you, you need what I call closure to hold uh, for each piece of this experiment. So in other words, you've got to be able to do some, an experiment where you, as where you have your initial flashes, let's say at time T1, and then you have flashes at time T2, and you can run the experiment many times, you can work out a probability distribution over the flashes at T2, given flashes at T1, and you can establish that that probability distribution is independent of anything you did at time T0. And so you've got to have this kind of closure condition holding for each, as you say, between time T1 and T2, and between, between, behind T2 and T3. And this this has to be in place for this kind of decomposition to work. So you're absolutely right that when you go zoom into details like that, you need to, to be very careful about how you set up an experiment like this. Thank you. So we have uh, Valerio, then Carlo, then we have a question online. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, we, we can stay on this slide. So my, my question was, uh, if instead of interpreting these these dots as uh, flashes, I interpret them as slits, uh, 
and I take a, the, the, what we compute as a single particle going through two series of slits, I, I think that your mathematical rules would derive essentially the superposition principle um, for slits, but then uh, it so turns out that uh, for particles, we know that both the symmetric and anti-symmetric things are realized, whereas for slits, it seems, I don't know if this is new or uh, never observed, that the anti-symmetric version would not be realized. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, I mean, yes, like I said, I, I reconstructed exactly the, the rule, as you say, for splits in the Feynman formalism, um, you know, in, back in 2010. And you're quite right. It's uh, an extraordinary thing that in that context, when you, when you put all of your assumptions together, um, that you, you, you simply only get the plus sign, right? You only get what we call superposition. And obviously you could go into the details and see why, if I would just pick out one thing that would kind of explain why you don't get the plus or minus possibility with the superposition principle, it's because you're within one model, right? You're not, you don't have two different models of the same data. So here really we've got two different models and we're the rule the symmetrization postulates arising because of a synthesis of these two models is a bridging, a way of bridging the two models. Whereas when we're do, dealing with a double slit experiment, you, you don't have that situation. Um, you can view it as a relationship between two actually realizable experiments. So I know that I, I, I don't think I can do much better than that, but um, you could have a look at the, 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 the earlier reconstruction and see it. One of the things about the derivation of the, the, the Feynman sum rule is there are a lot more symmetries available to you, uh, which are not available here. So there, there are a lot of constraints um, uh, which you can impose, but it, it, I don't think I can give a very much better answer than that. But yes, it is a remarkable fact that there is a plus or minus here. And, and I, there's an article by Feynman where he says, the plus sign when it comes to symmetrization postulate is something I can understand. And he sort of makes the remark that something like, well, you know, it kind of should be a plus, but I, so, but, it, but there's also a minus in there. And that's the mystery. Why is there a minus? And that comes across also in, in kind of the quantum field theoretic picture where uh, allowing an arbitrary number of quanta per, per cell, if you like, is fine. Um, the, the difficult one to explain is, well, why is there an occupancy restriction? Why only zero or one quanta per cell? So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, there is a question by Carlo. Um, I, uh, Philip, this is Carlo. Um, Hi, Carlo. I, I like the idea of the flashes. Um, Schrodinger at hand at the end of his life, got to the same reading of particles, just flashes, it um, talks about the electron in terms of instantaneous appearances. Um, I, on the other hand, am um, um, quite pushed away when you talk about mental things, and I am uh, sort of even more, let me say, confused when you talk about experimental um, the flash has been experimental uh, data. So the question is the following. If the flash is experimental data, and if reality is, an, is, is experimental data, is there any reality not here about Andromeda, but all an, on Andromeda, where there are no experimenters, uh, presumably? Yeah, I mean, as I said, the, the I, I put those thoughts out tentatively and with a certain trepidation because uh, you know it's it's uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm. What I would say is this: that I mean, I think Penrose himself, for example, was pushed to this. Uh, actually, there's a there's a very nice volume, a sh small volume, uh, which is a discussion between Abner Shimoni um, and Penrose, and I forget someone else. And this comes up in discussion that. Um, that we, we may need a notion of, of mentality, of observer, which transcends the normal picture that we have, that we are observers or embodied observers, that we may need to introduce some kind of primitive mentality, which is, I think, the term used by Shimoni, 
that we need to may need to introduce the notion of some kind of primitive mentality as part of reality. Um, and so in that sense, we, we would be able to say that in some sense, there is a reality, right? In some sense, there are, as I said, the persistence model, in some sense, there are objects out there. But that that is a view, right? That is already a view that's um, that's loaded with theoretical assumptions. And so it has a limited validity. And I think this is the, the uncomfortable, as I said, the uncomfortable place that I think we're put in, even by Bohr himself, in his original understanding of complementarity, that we have these different conceptions and they capture some truth and we can we can do physics with them we can create physical theories out of them but the separate pictures are not absolutely valid um, and as i said this tension exists all the way through metaphysics i mean uh, all the way from the ancient greeks with their contradiction with their paradoxes of part and whole all the way to the present time so th th these are these are heady matters to somehow understand how you make, you know, you're not even talking about quantum physics. I mean, these, these are considerations that come from, from uh, just reflecting on everyday experience. Uh, should I you cut me out? It's better. You have Reinhardt and also a question online. I don't know if, if it. Yes. So yeah, there is. There should be one person online. Sorry, now the online question, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, yes. If no, is it? What's the name? No. Hello. So uh, you can ask your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, yes, now I have been added as a panelist. Um, I'm sorry for, for cutting Carlos' reply. Um, it's a very interesting talk. I have a bit of a comment and then a question. Um, the bit of a comment is, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, in the classical case, you could recover the property of persistence due to the traceability of the process between the flashes, right? Um, then if, this is the case. You you could do the same in the quantum case if you know the unitary that connects the flashes and therefore create a model such as the Deutsch Haydn picture of quantum mechanics. Uh, have you thought about those lines? Yes, I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand, but let me go, go back to the first thing you said. So in a classical picture, um, what I was saying is that persistence is a theoretical assumption that we make, right? something that's beyond the, the, the data, like the bare data, the bare experience. Um, and then indeed, yes, yeah, so there are some, as it were, reality sort of cooperates to make it possible for us to, as agents, re-identify. Um, but it's not a fact of the matter that there are these persistent individuals. That's something that, at least in the way I'm thinking, it's something that we, we bring as observers uh, to the data. Um, in the case of quantum theory, I, I'm not quite sure you understand. What I'm, trying to, what I'm doing here really is reconstructing the rule that allows us to even talk, to even handle identical particle, systems of identical particles in the first place. So until you have that understanding of how you handle these systems, you can't even talk about unitary evolution. So that the unitary evolution would only come into play once you've got these persistence and non-persistence models. So from, from the perspective of those two models, what's happening when we say deal with the helium atom is that we write down a Hamiltonian in the persistence model where we, where we have these labels one and two for the two electrons. And that's itself imported largely from classical physics where persistence is an assumption is fine. And then we use this bridging rule, the symmetrization postulate as a bridging rule to somehow synthesize that persistence model with the non-persistence model. And that allows us to write down in the end a wave function, which describes the data, whether it's not a fact of the matter that there's a particle one and a particle two, there are just these two flashes. So I don't know if that helps. I, I don't think 
I understood that the last I, part I of this Hadlen uh, model. Sorry, oh, maybe yes. you ask your question. Let's uh, go to the last quick question by Rana Rana, and then we yeah, have to quick. move to the next speaker. Sorry. I, I guess I'm even less of a flashist than Carlo. Um, and especially when they're used as ontological crutches. So, so the Bohmians have turned to flashes on, of trying to do relativistic things as, and a, a flash ontology, right? So I don't think we need that here at all. So th this, this kind of argument I think is nice if you want to motivate, motivate the symmetrization principle. The one thing to observe here is that there's nothing special about position, right? So this works in any basis or in any, uh, in any way to write your Hilbert space as an integration space. And that is a really miraculous thing. So that if you do this corresponding argument in momentum space, you get exactly the same result in the end, or the same effect of Hilbert space. So once you realize that, I think it's a good time to throw away the ladder and use the thing, right? So, so this, this is, I think this may, this kind of argument, may help you to get to the thing in, a, in the lecture course, but I don't think it's a systematic, uh, a systematic way of quantum reasoning. Okay, okay so yeah, what I would say is the expression that, of taste here, right? So yeah, well, yeah, I would say it's just a question of whether you, whether you think interpretation is, is, is useful as a program really. Um, and, and of course people are divided on that. But um, yeah, certainly if you want to, what I would say is when you, if you want to interpret um, the formalism that we have, the symmetrization postulate, then this seems to be the sort of process that one needs to go through. And I would say that it also feeds back on the use of the symmetrization postulate. I didn't get a chance to talk about it here, but it impacts things like whether identical particles are entangled and what that even means and whether that can be harnessed uh, technologically. So there are, there are also implications, feedback from the interpretation to the application. Uh, and as far as the, you know, the, the ontology, you know, what one can say, what I would, what I would certainly say is that, that complementarity as an idea here is, is a, I think that's a sound uh, category in which to place this. In other words, there is another kind of complementarity at play here, hidden behind this apparently innocuous rule that we, we all use, symmetrization postulate. So there is a new kind of complementarity at play, which I think is very interesting. What you then make of that uh, conceptually in terms of ontology is very much in the air. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to know what to say about that. Um, and so one can refrain from, from that kind of further reflection. But I think one thing one can take away from this is that there really seems to be a new kind of complementarity at work. Thanks. Um, let's thank Philip again. Okay.